Good. I'm with Martine from AMD. Let's start with the basic question. Martine, who are you? What's your title? Good morning, Leo, and everybody watching. Uh, my name is Martijn Boonstra. I am a um, enthusiast, um, gamer, overclocker, and uh, fortunate to be working at AMD on these great products uh, from both the client side and the Radeon side. Um, product marketing, um, business development manager as well, uh, but also trying to tie everything together from our engineering meetings to executive meetings to getting launch plans together for our global sales and marketing teams um, whenever we have new products and also work with the ecosystem partners like Corsair, for example, to make that sure that their products are compatible and performing well on our upcoming products. In other words, you're wholly overqualified for these very basic questions about DDDR5. So <laughs> let's start at the top. Uh, first question, does faster memory make your PC or laptop faster or does it remove bottlenecks in performance? Um, it's a good question. I think you're going to hear this uh, a lot. It really depends on the application, right? So um, faster memory can certainly make things feel snappier or give you additional, let's say, frame rate in games. Uh, we typically see that in many workloads like gaming, where um, not just faster memory, but also tighter timings or lower latency uh, really rewards you with more performance. So it can be definitely a lot, um, um, you know, adding to the experience overall or it can become a bottleneck if you're choosing, let's say, a configuration which is, which is suboptimal. Okay, second question, which is more important, clock speed or latency? Again, that really depends on the application. In, in most scenarios like gaming, um, they will favor latency um, due to the nature of how games are being developed. Whereas, for example, applications or content creation apps that are influenced by memory usually uh, benefit from speed or bandwidth. Um, and I think if we tie this to AMD products, like for example, AM5, uh, most, games are most games are usually found in um, tightening timings and having the right balance between um, the system uh, that you've chosen to configure with. Okay, um, a question I didn't put in my list to you originally, so I'm bouncing this on you. Four DIMMs versus two. Um, after I, I did a previous call a week ago with uh, an Intel rep, Dan Ragland, on very similar subjects, and a few questions came back saying, uh, four DIM kits, what's the story? So take it away. Right. Um, good question. It really depends on the platform and the use case. So, for example, for uh, workstation like solutions, we have our Threadripper products, which either support four channel or eight channel memory. Um, those boards are obviously tuned as well to fully support four DIMMs or eight DIMMs in a way that, you know, um, the engineering teams on the ODM side, uh, the resources spent there, the time spent there to make kits, um, uh, you know, um, pass testing, uh, make it on the QVL lists and so on. It's a different kind of um, application and use case. So for gaming and for, let's say, mainstream desktop PCs, dual channel makes the most sense uh, because it's easy to set up. It's the price performance sweet spot. Um, it gives you the most performance uh, where typically those PCs are used for gaming slash office slash internet browsing and so on, uh, which is where dual channel makes the most sense in terms of a return on investment, I would say. How much memory should I install in my gaming PC as we end 2023? Uh, good question, Leo. I think if you look at the price um, today for DDR5, a 16 or 32 gigabyte kit, dual channel, as I mentioned, especially for gaming PCs, uh, it feels like really the sweet spot right now. If you look at, um, you know, if you use more memory, if you need more memory bandwidth, then obviously 64 gigs or a 128 gig kit is fine, but that's usually not found in a uh, gaming purpose build. Now, obviously you and I are well used to the power of two. Uh, so we had 16, 32, 64, and now we have this bizarre density of 48 that's come along quite recently. To you, is this a novelty or does this plug a useful gap in the market, that gap between 32 and 64? Or is it just something that's a bit curious? I mean, it gives people more options, which is not a bad thing, right? I mean, if you look at um, people's spends um, in terms of what they're looking for in terms of a total system cost, having more options out there is always a good thing. So I would say, let's see where this goes. I mean, it's, it's just been launched recently. Uh, we'll see um, throughout time, throughout 2024, if those options remain, let's say, popular or become more popular. Um, but yeah, it's all about having more options, which I can never be um, you know, negative about, obviously. 
And on the subject of options, RGB lighting on memory, is it a good thing or can it hurt your memory? Oh, you know, when turning it on, you get a million FPS, right? So that's <laughs> that's how it works. Now, it's it's a different type of bus voltage, everything in terms of the power delivery and so on. So it won't take anything away from the performance of the memory itself or from the CPU performance or have any impact on gaming performance. Uh, so it either uh, it neither helps or hurts performance. Uh, but I've heard the rumor that if you turn it on to red, it gives you extra frame rates. So. I feel embarrassed for giving you that open goal. Um, <laughs> should I be concerned about the temperature of my memory? I'm particularly thinking of DDR5 here, or is pretty much anything fine? Well, I, in general, with memory, with most memory, you shouldn't have to worry about RAM temperatures. Uh, most, let's say, higher spec or higher frequency kits have their own uh, heat sinks installed, or um, at least to take advantage of a a system that has at least one single case fan in place or some well ventilated case uh, which gives you at least decent airflow i would say where uh, you know in some cases let's say if you live in a country where the overall temperature the ambient temperature is a little bit higher or humidity plays a role as well especially with small form factors you may want to tune um you know your um, um overall system ventilation a little bit in case of uh, DDR5 memory, which tends to get slightly hotter than DDR4 or the previous generations. Uh, but overall, you shouldn't really have to worry about DDR5 memory getting hot. Excellent. Do motherboard QVL lists tell the full story? Yes and no. So Q <laughs> QVL lists usually contain parts that have been pre-tested or verified to work on a specific motherboard. Now that doesn't say that a, tis a list, uh, sorry, a model that's not on that list isn't going to be compatible with that motherboard. It just gives you a verified answer. Like if you're building a new PC, if you check out the QVL, it usually helps. Your favorite brand will be on there, like you know, Corsair Dominator and so on. Vengeance. Uh, you can just take a look. Scroll down the list and see if that specific kit that you're eyeing for is on that list. And when it is, you're 100% guaranteed that it will work with that motherboard and CPU configuration. Um, but again, a kit that's not on the list may as well work. And this is also one of the main reasons we created Expo, for example. Uh, with that profile enabled, it should enable you know, the most stable uh, solution for a memory configuration with a specific motherboard. Um, and if a kit has memory, uh, sorry, if a memory kit has Expo, um, it should work on most motherboards, even though it's not listed in the QVL. Excellent. Um, so moving on to how how you configure your own PC or even laptop. If the customer enables XMP or Expo, as far as you're concerned, is that the job done nice and easy? Or is that just the starting point and then you look for extra free gains? Yes, yeah, a good question. I think Overall, Expo will cater to 99% of the uh, gamers out there, right, in the target audience, which is basically a simple toggle. Enable it, you get the, um, you know, the, the utmost stability from the kit, uh, from the system overall, and you get the most performance that a kit has been rated for or pre-tested for. Uh, and that's mostly uh, done for the majority of the gamers out there. It's basically a guarantee that you're going to get most out of the kit. Whereas obviously in the hands of some skilled overclockers, there's always room to squeeze out a little bit more performance. And I would say, you know, if you look at overclocking in general, um, DDR5 overclocking or DDR uh, memory overclocking in the past has always been the most challenging overclock to, to have uh, stable and actually, um, you know, gain more advantages over an XMP or Expo um, setting, for example. Um, you'll find yourself um, rewarding with more frame rate when you start overclocking CPU or GPUs uh, more. So I would say for the majority of the cases, keeping the system stable, Expo is a terrific profile to just enable and be done with it. And in case you do need more performance, um, have a look at CPU and GPU overclocking for sure. Expo is a relatively recent marketing term, um, AMD for years, it, essentially the shorthand we all used was enable XMP. We've seen Expo, I can't, top of my head, last couple of years possibly in the BIOS, uh, and we've seen memory kits are now specifically Expo for AMD, therefore you're good to go. Um, however, when you compare AMD memory speeds to Intel memory speeds. Intel's now claiming support for up to 8,000 mega transfers. The sweet spot at the minute, I think most of us consider for AMD is around 6,000 mega transfers. 
however that's changing but that's not purely memory speed that's also to do with the internal buses within the system so on the face of it Intel does faster memory than AMD but that's a very rough overall view of the matter what's the deeper dive on that i would say it depends on the platform overall right i mean it's like a fast race car um, you can have the fastest engine in there but if you have do not have the drivetrain for example or um, the overall setup right uh, you may not benefit from that faster engine so very much with memory uh, we've tuned our platforms to be you know, uh, as stable as possible, obviously, but that's the first um, that you need to do. But secondly, uh, the way that AMD and Zen architecture works, uh, you may have seen that from the past as well, Leo, is that we are very sensitive to memory timings rather than overall speed. And I think having that sweet spot with, you know, higher frequency, and, and we've come a long way, right, from Ryzen 1 in terms of frequency where we are today with DDR5 going over 6,000 megahertz or mega transfers per second, um, but with lower latency, um, you'll find that fine tuning that, whether it's via an expo profile or via manual overclocking, you'll see uh, performance gains um, very much on our platform. And that's the way that our architecture works, right? Especially with the chiplet design and the Infinity Fabric, um, you'll find that, um, you know, there is headroom for sure, uh, but we obviously choose to have our system stable first and then make sure that you get enough performance from the way that the memory vendors work with us and then uh, we find the sweet spots um, and the, let's say the best choice to be 6000 megahertz for it for now for AM5. In either previous generation or previous previous generation there was the so-called valley of death where if your memory speed went beyond a certain point the bus speed would halve so although you're running a higher memory speed you could actually lose performance which in turn was as you're just alluding to related to AMD's over recent generations improve latency quite notably. So is 6000 still today the right speed, uh, the right memory speed for the latest Zen technology or are the updates to it? Okay. And the BIOS updates, uh, to say the word out loud, are, is the microcode a GISA? We use a GISA with the motherboard manufacturers to build around, you know, to have them build their BIOS around our microcode called a GISA. And with a GISA, Obviously, um, throughout its generation and updates that we bring out, we've tested more and more. We've introduced, um, you know, CPU optimizations, introductions for newer CPUs, introductions for higher memory frequencies. As we move along, working closely together with the ecosystem partners, with the DRAM vendors, uh, we find more performance, uh, better stability, um, and everything. And so, with a GISA updates, you'll find, um, you know, more. Um, overall platform enjoyment, I would say, uh, once we work uh, closely together with these motherboard manufacturers and they bring out BIOS updates based on Agisa updates. Lovely, thank you. And final question. So talking here about Martine rather than the typical end user, you've got your PC, you've got your motherboard, you've got some memory, uh, you've seen the spec of it, it's DDR5, call it 6600 and say C40. What's the first thing you do, say, to identify what are the actual memory chips on board? Are they Hynix, Micron or whatever? Do you have some favoured utility that can interrogate the memory successfully or do you literally remove the heat spreaders and look at the things? Well, as an overclocker, yes, um, because you would also want to know the revision sometimes of some modules, right? Um, but overall, I think with great tools like Ryzen Master, for example, it allows you to um, find um, basically everything about your system setup, help you fine tune. So depending on the configuration and depending on the um, applications that you run, whether it's games or um, you know memory bandwidth or memory frequency applications, you may find it rather than rather than overclocking the memory to sometimes downclock it slightly and to be able to um, let's say open up lower latency um, at your disposal, which could then help you actually gain performance rather than having higher frequency. So as I said in the beginning of the interview, it really depends on the application. And so I would then look at what am I building the system for? Is it mainly gaming? Uh, then yes, uh, lowering latency would one of it would be one of my top priorities. And using Ryzen Master, for example, helps you identify what kind of memory um, uh, kits that you really have and what kind of uh, chips are on the kit. 
Um, and then there's also profiles with uh, many of the motherboard manufacturers preloaded in the BIOS nowadays, where you can try under vaulting, overclocking, um, various settings, whether it's Hynix, Samsung, Micron, and so on, uh, whatever um, chips on the kit. Uh, and that basically is, is also a good way to, um, you know, extract even more performance from a standard kit that you've purchased. I think that covers everything. I'm, I'm happy to wrap up unless there's some other, any other points you wish to um, cover. If you think we've covered everything, then that's, I'm happy to end. If you've got anything else, feel free. No, I think just overall today, if you look at where the platform is, AM5 uh, with DDR5 pricing coming down to a very respectable price point, I would say for many gamers out there. If you look at the Ryzen 5, Ryzen 7 segment, or if you're an ultra enthusiast looking at Ryzen 9, um, you can have really interesting DDR5 kits today with high frequency, low latency that really benefits um, from a well-balanced system and really rewards you with higher frame rates. So yeah, be sure to check out your favorite price comparison websites, your favorite e-tailers, um, and you know, make sure that you, you take a good look at um, yours truly, uh, Leo, uh, the reviews that you do, uh, I mean, we, you know, you, you have a really good sense of, um, you know, price performance. I usually see that come back in your reviews as well. Does it make sense to purchase this over this or yes or no? Um, and that's something that, you know, I would give as an advice to anybody listening or um, viewing this as an interview. Um, just go check out the reviews that Leo and the team are doing. It's, it's fantastic. So, yeah. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Leo. It's absolutely my pleasure. And thanks for having me.